Hello again, awesomers. It's me. It's your old buddy, Steve Simonson. And guess what? Yes, you found it. It's another awesomers.com podcast episode. This one is number 190, for goodness sake. Uh, you almost think I have no other things to do in this life except record podcasts for you guys. So that's good news for, for you. And it just means that I'm continuing to burn the midnight oil just for you guys listening. So uh, thanks, everyone, one and all, for uh, so many reviews and, and joining us. Today is awesomers.com slash 190, as I said. So you just go to that one, uh, awesomers.com slash 190. That's the secret code to find today's show notes and details. Now, today I'm joined by Emma, and she runs Marketing by Emma or Marketing with Emma. Which one is it, Emma? It's by. By Emma. See, that, that yeah. would be better copywriting. If I knew what I was doing, I would know that. So, uh, Emma, why don't you give the audience a little bit of a background on you and, and tell us where you came from and, and how you started your company. Sure. So I, I took a little bit of a winding road to get to owning my own business. I'm not one of those people that is a, considers themselves a born entrepreneur. And I also kind of had a little bit of a winding road, tried a lot of different things before I really realized that my strengths lie lie in writing and communicating. And so then once I realized that that was something that I could develop professionally, I began to explore that more seriously. So that led me to living in a lot of different places. I taught English in Spain. I uh, worked on a farm and fine dining restaurant in Illinois. <laughs> That's an interesting combo, a farm and fine dining. It, it was an interesting combination, and I've never worked as hard in my life. Chefs have an amazing work ethic, and when you combine that with farming, you... <laughs> wow, that is like, uh, that's hard work squared, right? I mean, first of all, for, for those who don't know, chefs work around the clock. They It's the worst hours ever uh, because they're, they're, you know, every night, every weekend, every everything, that's when people want their dinners. And they like the chefs to, the, who have the talent to prepare them. Farmers are the ones up in the morning farming all that stuff. I can't imagine having somebody with both of those work habits. My goodness. Yeah, it was, it was quite the uh, experience. I was much younger and it was a lot of fun, but it was very difficult and not necessarily something I'd like to continue doing at this point in my life. But I think the underlying thread with all of that is that I'm just a very curious person. And that's what I think has really allowed me to not only love entrepreneurship, but to love what we get to do as marketers, because it's all about not only getting curious about people and their products, but about why people do what they do and how even something as simple as one word like with or by can completely change the meaning of something and how somebody will respond to that. First so of in all, all oh, I, yeah. I want to say that the, the native curiosity that you have, right? That, that just built in, maybe it's innate curiosity. You can copyright all this stuff later and get it right for me, Emma. But the, the key is, you know, being curious is a natural entrepreneurial characteristic finding the the common thread of what you like that is very elusive for people entrepreneurs often find themselves pulled in a thousand directions so kudos to you on kind of narrowing the field to into that communication and, and copy world um how long did it take you on that journey i mean what what was the time from beginning to end kind of so I guess when I started really doing copywriting was around the time that I was working on the farm uh, because they realized that I maybe wasn't as good in the kitchen, but could really help them <laughs> tell their <laughs> Oh boy, that's a subtle, uh, <clears throat> hey, uh, well, it's not going I, so great in the kitchen, Emma. Why don't I, you go out and write the menu or what did they have you do? Well, I just don't have the hustle that I'm going to be using a mandolin confidently and quickly. So it's not that I don't know how to cook. It's that I don't have that army discipline. It really is a line process back there. Yeah. yeah. So that I was fine to take a little bit more of a backseat to that and help them with things like their newsletters and telling their story. They weren't even yet in a restaurant space. And so it was really about building awareness. And so being able to communicate what they were doing and why they were doing was incredibly important. And that's when I first started to think, hmm, okay, this is sort of interesting. Still didn't know that that was the path I wanted to take. Uh, and it wasn't actually until I was living in Israel that I 
focused my efforts specifically on wanting to go in the marketing direction. So it was something that I'd been doing for a long time, but that was the point that I said, okay, this is the career path that I would really like to explore. Uh, so that was a, a period of uh, several months, several years. Oh yes, you'd asked about the time. Uh, that was probably in a stretch of three to four years Amazing. time. Yeah, that uh, just shows uh, what a bright uh, uh, learner you are because to, to, to consolidate that much knowledge that fast is really impressive. Um, you know, I have to <laughs> imagine you. that, you know, when you see when you see somebody who needs to tell their story and then you can tell the story, that's probably pretty gratifying, right? I assume there was some payoff uh, fulfilling uh, wise for you. Is that true? I would say very much so. It's, it can be really difficult to tell your own story. Even in this conversation right now, I feel much more confident helping other people tell their stories than I do telling my own. But I think there are many reasons for that. And one of those being is that you have this up close view of your own story. And so it can be really difficult to know what are those details that are worth sharing and what are those other things that maybe either don't relate or are just clouding the water and taking away from that core story that's so important. And so now I completely lost track of what your actual question No, you're, you, you did very fine, Eric. Was. Don't worry. We're going to edit all this out. If you're one of those awesomers who just heard this wonderful exchange, then you have the inside track. No, it's really quite good. And if I can help reframe this just a bit. Sure. So when you tell somebody's story, you do, in fact, get a sense of fulfillment because you can see what they can't see, right? This is the old saying of, you know, you, you can't see the forest because of all the trees, right? You're stuck in it. You can't see from the outside. And instead of telling the story about, well, here's how I got started and here's why it's interesting, you get caught up in talking about the hangnail that you had that just would not go away. And that's not interesting to people. It's kind of gross, right? So that, that's the point for entrepreneurs to listen to is to, to get somebody else who can, can help evoke what that story is. And every company, every entrepreneur has a story. That's what I believe. What do you think, uh, Emma? I believe 100%. I think a lot of times people think that their story needs to relate exactly to the product that they're selling. And so they can get kind of lost there because they're saying, okay, well, if I'm selling a garlic press, how does my story really help push that garlic press forward? But your story doesn't have to be about helping people mince garlic quickly or be able to chop garlic without getting a stinky garlic scent on their hands that they carry around for the next few days. It can be about helping people to spend more time with their families, which wouldn't be an immediately obvious element to a story. And then thinking about how that relates to the choices you make and the things that you do. And I think also people get lost in thinking about their story as that about page on their website. And your story is so much more than that. Your story is, is something that's happening all the time with every single choice that you make within your business. So it's something that you want to be mindful of in how you choose to engage with your customers and how you think about your packaging. And all of those little details are working together to contribute to your story as a brand and as a business owner. Well, I, I couldn't have said it better myself that the company story is a living, breathing thing, and it doesn't have to have direct relevance to what you're selling. In fact, rarely does it. I mean, not all of us, like I do come from a long line of garlic uh, dynasty uh, people. So I personally can, I get the garlic press need and necessity and everyone should have one. But if you don't and, and your, your motive for getting in the business, it, whatever it is, it should be true. That's kind of my thing is you should be authentic. It should be telling the true story. And I, I know, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of entrepreneurs with origin stories that are extraordinary, right? The, the struggles that they faced and then the decision that they made and the risks they took, all of those things are part of everyone's story in some way. Is that, am I on the right track here, over here? Yes, exactly. 100%. It's uh, all of those little experiences that we accumulate that make it so that we want to do this one thing at this time. And it's why it can be so difficult to tell your story, like we were talking about earlier, where you're kind of getting lost between what's relevant, what's important for people to know, what is something that maybe doesn't need to be in your actual written story, but you can communicate that in some other way. And particularly in 
the world that we live in now with so much competition and so many things that have relatively minor differentiation, a lot of times it's the story and those other choices that you're making as a business that can really make the difference and set you apart and make you a company that people want to work with versus one that they scroll past or, you know, whatever way that they're encountering you in the world. Well, this is the what makes you different? What makes you special is your story. It's not your product. I I hate to break it to people, you know, unless you invented the pet rock or something actually interesting, it's very unreasonable for you to expect your product to be the the sole star of the show. And there's probably other people who sell the same stuff as you. So now you are just among the, the noise that's out there in the marketplace. So how do you set yourself apart? In my opinion, one of those reasons is that you tell your company story and despite my best efforts to get people to tell their company stories, they're still doing it in a very robotic linear way. Like uh, here is my address. This is my phone number. Uh, you know, I started in 19, whatever, 91 or 19, you know, 2020, whatever it is, it's all very lineal and fact-based versus kind of what the true, you know, reasons that motivated people. How do you get that out of people? How How do you fix the problem? You ask a lot of questions and sometimes people feel a little irritated by that because they're like, oh, this is, you know, like if we're working with somebody to create their, to help them put their story into words, they're like, but we hired you to write this thing and now I'm having to go do all this homework and answer a bunch of questions. But it really is a collaborative experience because we can't tell somebody's story without knowing all of the things that led them to get there. And then we can work with them to figure out what's important and what's not. But it's really about uh, understanding the those core things that matter and continuing to ask why. So a lot of times those, those first surface level answers will be those more factual sort of things. Okay, we found it in this at this, on this date, we are selling these products. And they say, okay, well, why, why did you start on this particular date? Why are you selling these products? And then you keep going layer by layer until you start to get those deeper answers, those deeper motivators. But a lot of times you'll also discover kind of a core connector between all of those different things. And so then you can begin to weave it all together into something that is a little bit more cohesive and compelling. Well, this is a very important point that Emma just focused on, which is the, the, the point of the company story is not just to tell the company origin story, which in its own right has value. It is in fact to generate a, almost a, a, a conversation between all the products, right? There, there's this entire line of brand authority and brand impression that goes with telling the story. Why did you bring this product, right? We, now we understand why you brought the business. Why this specific product? you know, and how does it fit into the overall scheme of things? Often there really is a commonality between all these things that, that has something more than just, well, I searched for the BSR and it was, you know, this and that there, again, there's always facts, but the emotion will play far more with the, the end audience. And I think the more transparent, and if I may say vulnerable that people are with their story, the part that's probably embarrassing to them is probably the most compelling part of the story. Do you find that to be true? I find that to be true. And I think you make such a great point. And it's about being vulnerable as a person and as a business. And in general, we think about businesses as these kind of sterile entities And really your business in some ways is operating in the world as its own identity. And so in the same way with people, when you walk away from an interaction and it felt meaningful and like somebody that you really enjoyed that conversation with, oftentimes you weren't talking about the weather. You were speaking about something more more significant and ideally maybe even disclosing some more personal information that may feel a little bit scary to do, but helps to build stronger bonds. And so you're doing the same thing when you're communicating in that way with your business, but it also requires that you make some bold choices, not only with what you're choosing to share about yourself, but also being clear about who you're really trying to communicate to, because you can't just be talking for the sake of of talking 
about yourself. You need to remember that it's a conversation and that there's somebody on the other end and being really clear about who it is that you're speaking to so that you can make that a dialogue rather than just talking about how great you are. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, for all the awesomers out there rolling your eyes that are like, oh, first I thought I have to do a company story and I'm done. And now I actually have to know my target audience too. They're, they're outraged, by the way, Emma. What you say is very oh, controversial. No. Yeah, the, the, this is the truth of it, everybody. You can't sell to everyone. Let's just let that stew for a minute. Just think about that. I know you want to, and that's kind of the easiest thing philosophically to think of and go, well, I'll just put it online on Amazon. Everybody will buy it. But that's not actually how stuff works. You resonate, your product resonates to a certain specific kind of niche. And it doesn't matter. There, there are people who are you know, garlic press people and there's 50 different niches of garlic press people, maybe more. You know, I, don't, I, I can't do the count for you. The point is, if you understand your audience and you understand your story, it's going to be a lot easier for you to carry on uh, conversation, marketing points, all of it, the whole package, when you can uh, see the other side of it, right? If you are talking, if you're trying to sell to people who, you know, are, I don't know, basketball players, and you're talking a lot of, you know, flowery things that would appeal to moms with new babies, you, you got a mismatch there. And, and so I think you're really on point there, Emma. So as people start to define kind of their own story, their own, um, I don't know, target audience, what, what do they do next to kind of pull it together? So what the other great thing about having a clear target audience is it will help protect you from falling into that marketing cliched speak. So imagine the late night infomercial where you're just making these over the top statements and that may have worked in the past, but most customers are a lot more sophisticated these days. And so those really kind of aggressive, overly intense uh, phrasing and, and techniques don't work like they used to. And so being mindful of who your customer is, but then also what do they care about and what do they want to know and why are they getting online to go search whatever it is that they're searching to find your product. So it's not just about knowing who your customer is, but knowing what position they find themselves in, what problem they're encountering, that they feel enough discomfort that they're going to search for a particular solution that you happen to offer. Yeah, again, I think this is a salient uh, point of wisdom that needs to be kind of uh, focused in on for a second. It is, all of this is kind of bringing a, uh, a basket around your entire business or around your entire idea. What you do here, all of this work that you do with company story and identifying your market and then the voice of the, the customer, all of these things, once you understand that and even the voice of the business, you, that will inform your product making decisions. The next product you decide to bring and source and all that, all of these things are going on in your mind as you bring that next product in. And I guarantee you, over time, you're going to find that that will have a better impact because you actually thought about the end of the equation at the beginning, unlike the, oh, I did a search on, you know, fill in the blank uh, software and it said this was a good seller. So I bought a thousand of them and put my sticker on it. That's, that's not branding. That's, that's transacting and that's fine. We got to do what we got to do to get started. But if you really want to build value, you want to build equity, you got to take it up a notch. And Emma's telling you how to do that right now. So Emma, as you think about the building blocks of this, what do they do next? How do they take the next action if there is one? So you're clear about your problems and then you need to understand how both your brand and your product is and how you want to position those both to be addressing those problems and all the things that a customer needs to know in order to make an informed, competent decision about whatever it is that you're selling and being thoughtful about everything from the type of language you use. So if your customers are, like if you're selling skincare, that's way too general. If you're selling skincare to somebody who is 18 and doesn't re even really need skincare yet, but her favorite beauty YouTubers are telling her how she needs to 
start a skincare regimen to protect herself from the evil wrinkles that are looming around the corner, then you want to make sure that you're using the kind of language that a person like that would want and expect to see versus trying to sell a moisturizer that's meant for somebody in their 60s who knows that they're not going to be able to get rid of wrinkles and it's really more of helping to manage the 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 skin that they have now and make it look as great as it possibly can and and they're not going to uh the slang that an 18 year old is going to be pretty off-putting to somebody in their 60s. So uh, that would be the ultimate in culture class right there. I would love to see those listings reversed. <laughs> the one for uh, the, the boomer and the one for the 18-year-old. I can only imagine the, the differences in language. Amazing. And, and it's not even just the language, it's even the imagery. You'd be, so right. often I'll see products and they are clearly meant for more mature skin and they have, all of the images are young people in their early 20s. And so that's not relatable. Yeah. You know, obviously you could say, oh, well, it's aspirational, but people know that, that they're never going to be able to turn back the hands of time, even if they invest in surgery, they're not going to look like they did at 20. So it's, it's more of a mismatch and something that you would make an assumed decision because you think that's what you're supposed to do when you're selling skincare rather than an informed decision about what your customers would really want to see when they're looking at a piece of marketing for them. And by being able to do that, you're probably going to differentiate yourself from the majority of, of your competitors who are just doing that same copy paste imagery that is not at all relatable to your customers. So it's every single little piece that you wanna make sure is honed in and focused. And so you also want to be sure that as you're, as you're creating whatever it is that you're creating, whether it's a product page for Amazon or for your own website, you want to think about how the text and the imagery play together. Because while text itself is really strong and imagery itself is really strong, some of the most powerful marketing actually comes when you can combine text and imagery together. Because there are a lot of things that it would take a lot of words or would be difficult to communicate clearly just with text. And then on the other hand, whether it's a video or a still image, if you don't have the text there, then you're leaving the interpretation up to the customer. And so like with your background, we have this beautiful seascape and it looks like there's a yacht in the background. And me- That's my yacht over there, yeah. <laughs> So perhaps when I look at that picture, I'm instantly transported back to when I was 20 and studying abroad in Ecuador and got to go to the Galapagos Islands. But that's Ooh. probably not the experience that you're thinking about or the message that you're taking about taking when you looked at that same image. No, when I see it, I, this is actually the island we used to transport uh, the product from the, uh, well, to say Columbia uh, up to Florida. And this was our, well, listen, I'm getting into a lot of details here, but yes, you're right. That so, uh, each of us have our different kind of perception of this image. Therefore the words are help, that helps tie it together. It, for you, it could be come to the Galapagos. For me, it might be, um, you know, transport your product here and put it in the submarine. Yeah, that, that's what we did, everybody. This is how I uh, made my first million. Uh, so, as you as you have done that, so this is more than just copywriting, that you're saying that part of what you do with uh, your service is that you actually try to put all of that together. Is that true? Yeah, so we, we are very much a copywriting firm. So we don't take photos and we don't produce videos, but it's an inescapable fact that imagery is very powerful. And so you want to make sure that you are creating a cohesive message. And so like in the case of Amazon listings, when we're working on those, while we don't take the photos, 
we are happy to provide guidance and take that creative lead about suggesting the types of images that you should create, whether it's for infographics or for your A plus content, so that everything is working together towards the same goal, rather than having this mismatched uh, things that just don't make any sense together or, and that's kind of worst case, or aren't uh, really working together to achieve a common goal and they're just saying two sort of complementary things. Yeah, I do appreciate cohesion. And, and most of you uh, Oscars out there listening, when you, you know it when you see it, right? That, that's the, the truth of it. When you see, you know, and, and there's many, many examples of superlative marketing out there where it's all working together as a team. The, the purple mattress campaign, the, you know, uh, squatty potty, any of those things, they're, they're both, they're engaging, they, they bring in the story, they, they put the images together, the, the words all make sense, and, and it speaks to their target audience. There are so many examples of this, uh, and I, I appreciate the fact that you guys think beyond just your own kind of area of responsibility, because what makes your stuff work the best, the copy and the, the deliverables from your firm, it really relies in, in some ways on these other components, right? It, it's certainly not going to have the, the best impact if you don't match up these other things. Is that true? Exactly. And so since we don't do all of those other things, we want to set people up for the most likely opportunity for success possible. And also I'm a little bit of a perfectionist and a control freak and <laughs> which <laughs> all right that's good is not necessarily uh, always the best of qualities but then that allows us to really make sure that the vision that we have when we're writing something is executed to the very best but also we find that a lot of like we actually just started doing this first when we when clients came they're like well i don't have a photographer yet and so i'll come back to you and we're like no no let's get started now and we can detail you know the modules that you need to choose and the images to create and so it was more just for us to be able to get projects moving that we initially started doing this and then before too long, we started to get all of this positive feedback about how amazing this service was because rather than them having to manage their designers and figure out who was calling the shots, they just send out their their project and it has a clear brief for the designer to follow. And so it's easier for everybody and there's a clear kind of decision maker. And so there's not all of this back and forth and they don't have to be managing all of it. Boy, that uh, that does sound attractive, and I'm not going to lie. So, what? Let's talk about the the uh, a typical customer that you interact with. They they show up. They've got one or more of these problems. H how does the process work for you guys? So, the process works first and foremost of just establishing what exactly it is that a client needs and making sure that our solution is the best solution for where they are with their problems. And so. Sometimes people come to us and they have a listing that isn't performing as well as they hope or expected it to be performing. And so first we would just take a look at that and see what's going on. Is this something that, it, that we feel confident that we can help fix? Or is this maybe some other problem and we're not the correct fit for them to navigate this, whether it was a poor product choice or they're having issues with reviews or any number of things that can't necessarily turn around with a pretty listing. So once we figure out that this is something that we can help with, or in the case of a client that's coming and they're launching a new product, and so then we're just starting from scratch, um, it's pretty simple. They receive a questionnaire, that dreaded questionnaire that I oh, yeah. that's, mentioned. That's a showstopper right there. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> uh, and, and from there, it, it's pretty simple. We receive the, the details. We write up the listing. If they like it, then they can go ahead and upload it. If not, then we will work to make any changes that need to be made. And on top of that, we've never once missed a deadline since hmm. our first day in 2016. So when you receive your delivery date after we've reviewed your brief and make sure that we have everything that we need, uh, you're, you're locked in and that's a, a promised date that we will 
do, you know, even if the internet was out, I would find a way to make sure that you get your project on time. I love it. Yeah, that's uh, clearly a brand promise that uh, you take very seriously. And that probably uh, is a corollary yeah, corollary of uh, being a control freak, to be honest. But uh, I love the fact that you can deliver a predictable service on time, every time. That actually is the mark of somebody who is running a good system. So kudos on that. Uh, what about, is this, uh, is it a one woman show over there? Uh, how many resources do you have or how does it work exactly as a team? If so it, we're, it, yeah, we're located here in Columbia, Missouri, which for those of you that are not familiar with the geography of the United States or the hazy middle part of the United States, if you closed your eyes and pointed to what you presume to be the middle of the U.S., that's probably not far off from where we are. And so we have a small team here. Uh, we were in-house, now we're remotely in-house. Uh, my husband and I are business partners, and then we have a small team of writers and editors and, um, and a, you know, an office manager to help us make sure that this all runs as smoothly as possible. Nice. Well, that, I mean, definitely shows a commitment and the, the fact that you've been doing it for so long and, and have so many good uh, experiences. Uh, and as I, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, the marketing by Emma, I got it right, yes? Yep. Yeah, marketing by Emma. Uh, this is an aligned empowery resource as well. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's so that means the awesomers out there, the empowery members, shareholders, etc. You guys get to take advantage of this, you know, highly qualified provider without all the worry and without all the fear. And that's that's ultimately what stops ninety percent of entrepreneur decision making is the fear. They're like, I got this problem, I have to solve it. That's non-negotiable. That's happening. But it always stops when there's a fear. There's a fear of, well, what if it doesn't work or what if, right? And there's a million what ifs. And the reality is you can't just expect one thing to be a silver bullet. If you have a, a crappy conversion rate and you think making one change is going to solve it 100%, I, I would beg to differ. I, I think you, you'd really need to look at the thing, as Emma does, from the top level down and figure out what about the images? What about the infographics? What about the A-plus copy? All of these various things have to play a role. Am I on the right track here, Emma? Do you agree with me? I agree with you. And just to kind of divert it momentarily, but I think it's worth mentioning, you're talking about these fears and sometimes it can be difficult to think in the mind of other people. And so as you're starting to do some of this brand work and the story development and understanding your customers, pay attention to yourself and how you're thinking when you're trying to make decisions, whether it's purchasing decisions for your business or just in your own life when you're going to browse online, start paying attention to all of those things because it will give you a lot of great insight into how your customers are probably thinking, even if it's not specifically related to the product that you're selling. Yeah, very, very sage wisdom there. The, you know, when we are in our own business, we cannot get outside of those walls. It doesn't matter what we do. It's really, really difficult to kind of fly above it all, no matter how good or how experienced we may think we are, it's it's just it's just the nature of being in it instead of on it. So I like the outside perspective that somebody like Emma can bring to the the table. But your own experience when you're buying things, the things that that you really like at some place are really good lessons to learn, and the things you hate at some place are even better lessons to learn. Because man, oh man, you want to stop those things. Uh, that, that cause you to feel uh, negative vibes about that business or, you know, service or what have you. All of those things. We're, we're actually quite good buyers when we're buying for ourselves. We're not good buyers when we try to put ourselves in the shoes buying from our own business because we're like, why wouldn't you buy? It's my business. I want you to buy. I need to sell some stuff, right? That's, we, we start from a position of assumptive close and that's not where a customer begins. We have to we have to present the story and, and present the product and the value and, and tell them why we're solving their issue, whatever that issue may be. Uh, and really, Emma, you're here to help people solve their copywriting issue. So if you summed up kind of what you guys do in a nutshell, what, what would that uh, look like? So we help businesses selling online communicate effectively with their dream customers to increase their conversion rates. So it's sort of a, you know, by communicating effectively, you're able to sell more. And so that's really what our goal is and what we are 
fortunate enough to help lots of people be able to achieve. I love it. Well, that's uh, very well said indeed. So uh, first of all, for the customers out there listening again, I believe we're on uh, episode number 190. So awesomers.com slash 190. That's where you go to find show notes, details, and uh, calls to action, how you can get uh, in touch with Emma and so forth. It's really an important thing for people to consider, especially during these times, you know, is my company story being told well? And and I don't know if that's a separate service that you offer or or if you just do listings, but I, I think company stories are often overlooked. Maybe you could just answer that real quick, Emma. Do you guys help with company story? We do help with company story. While we really understand Amazon and we work with a lot of Amazon clients, first and foremost, we think of ourselves as a copywriting firm that just has the unique know-how of the e-commerce space. And so whether that's an Amazon listing or your own website or your product packaging, we can help create the text that's going to communicate about your brand and your product in a way that's going to resonate with your customers. I love it. That's uh, definitely highly, highly sought after and and a big need on that. So uh, I, I appreciate the time, Emma. I, in fact, I'm going to give you even a final word of wisdom. Is there anything that you think that people uh, should know about either your business, yourself, copywriting in general? What little nugget do you have for them? Ooh, a little nugget. Uh, I'm going to need to think about this for a moment. I'll play the Jeopardy music. (laughs) Yeah, I put you right on the spot there and it's okay. But I know that you got something that you would normally talk to customers or friends or whoever about what you do. Sure. So I would say, well, okay. I will give you a link to a free download that has a bunch of questions that we've put together because a lot of the time, even knowing what questions can to ask, can be very confusing. And so with this free download, it's not simply about going through the questions and and doing a quick hurried answer. It's really about using these questions both as a springboard to figure out what other questions you should be asking, but also as questions to think more deeply about all of the little things that you're doing. Because your brand story isn't just what you're doing for your customers. Your brand story is also a really awesome tool for helping align the choices that you're making with your business and helping make sure that your team is aligned with that as well. So it can be a great training tool. It can be a great recruiting tool. It can do so many different things, but when you're not really honed in on what that is, then you're just kind of saying a bunch of words that are falling flat and not going anywhere. So if you want that download, it's marketingbyemma.com slash empowery. And so that's just a bunch of questions that you can use to start thinking about your business, your competitors, your customers, and begin to ask some of those meaningful questions. Well, I think that's really valuable. Uh, knowing what you don't know is is really an amazing uh, revelation, right? It's starting to figure out, gosh, I didn't even know the questions, let alone the answers. So that's uh, marketingbyemma.com slash empower. Am I right? Yep. All right. We'll make sure we get a link on the show notes page at some point. Uh, awesomers.com slash 190. You'll find uh, maybe that link as well as a couple show notes and details, uh, not to mention the playbacks. Uh, Thank you again, Emma. It's been a real pleasure to see you uh, again here online. And thanks to the awesomers out there. And let me just give a final little bit of love to the awesomers who are leaving those nice five-star reviews. I really like you. I uh, would like to come over to your house and wash your car, but I'm in the lockdown. So just consider that's what I wanted to do, but I couldn't do it. For those that are listening and not leaving reviews and sharing it, I will find you and I'm coming for you. Let's stop listening for free, which I'm happy to do it for free, and not supporting the community. Get in here, people. Let's make it happen. Thanks again, Emma, and we'll see all the awesomers next time.